Hello, I'm Stephen Wynn, arts writer and critic in San Francisco. We're here today to speak to the four leading candidates for mayor about the arts. Angela Aliotto, London Breed, Jane Kim, and Mark Leno. We're going to speak to them first about their own experience of the arts, what has been important and inspiring to them. Then we'll move on to talk about how the arts can be supported and nurtured in San Francisco, how they are to be funded, and finally, what the role of the public schools and the arts are. Mark Leno, thank you very much for coming and talking to us about the arts today. My pleasure, Steve. We want to start first by talking about your personal experience, about something in your recent or not so recent past that you've seen a, a performance or a, something musical or something you've read that, sure. that was meaningful to you and, 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 and why. So let me just preface my response to say that for some unknown reason I have been blessed with musical and artistic people in my life. I don't know why I'm so lucky. Mm. Uh, I am a musical fan. I've got no talents myself, but I've been drawn to it from a very early age. And so the specific answer to your question, and it, I, don't, I have to forewarn you, I hate superlative questions. So I, I don't like the most this, uh, but I'll tell you my favorite. I got you. And anything that's, yeah. that's my, but significant. My, but my favorite color is blue. <laughs> okay, we got that. <laughs> You've covered the superlative. But uh, I would have to say of all the myriad of possible answers uh, to the question would be the San Francisco Symphony's Pride concert mm. a year ago last April. And the first time ever. And it came from an interesting place in that the symphony had planned to do some concerts on an East Coast tour that was taking them to Carnegie Hall, a couple of concerts at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I remember all this, of course. And yes. then mm -hmm. North Carolina and its legislature right. went down this mm -hmm. very unfortunate mm -hmm. path. And subsequently, the city of San Francisco, the state of California, banned any public travel to North Carolina as a protest. And uh, Mark Benioff led a corporate exodus in North Carolina and all of it around LGBT civil right. rights. Right. Mm -hmm. And this ridiculous non-issue of bathrooms. And so uh, a lifelong friend of mine, Michael Thomas, and the uh, folks at the symphony asked for my counsel as to whether they should go or not. And Michael, being creative always, thought maybe they should go and make a deal out of it and do a special concert there and shine mm -hmm. a light on the uh, LGBT community's historical value and contributions to classical music. And we, I had to tell Michael and the symphony, uh, no, you can't go, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just not gonna work. They lost. It's interesting discussion, though, isn't yes, it? Yes, and yeah. they lost some millions of dollars because right. they had to put down some down payments. Right. And there was the symphony mm -hmm. canceling a performance, so that's not good for the brand. Mm -hmm. But again, in his creativity, Michael thought, okay, well, how can we make some lemonade out of these lemons? Mm -hmm. And decided to do a special concert in San Francisco to do the very same thing he was thinking of doing in North Carolina. And so it became San Francisco Symphony's first Pride concert. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved. We had to raise a couple hundred thousand, I think maybe around three hundred thousand dollars, just about a month or two's time, to show the symphony that we could underwrite the whole thing. Uh, the concert was in April, so we had a due date early February, and we did that. Uh, the response was terrific. We had some new donors to the symphony, which is good for the organization. Mm -hmm. And I tapped some friends, and uh, Joshua Robeson kicked in uh, some effort and so we we did that and then the concert itself was just extraordinary uh, music almost exclusively uh, chosen from uh, known gay composers from Meredith Monk mm. to Stephen Sondheim mm. to Leonard Bernstein and everyone in between Laura Nero they did uh, Save the Country. I don't know if you know that song, know but that it's song. just terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Audra McDonald sang it for the first time. Yes. Michael told her, you should make this your anthem. <laughs> you know, because, and this was April 17, so not long after November 16. Mm. And there's a lyric from Save the Country, uh, if I can pull it up right now, but uh, save the country, save the country, save the country now. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you've really hit on the nexus of art and politics. You went, went yeah. right to it. Yeah. Let me ask you to sort of talk about how some of the values of music, which, you, which, you, which you've focused on, might inform your values as a mayor. What kinds of things is music inspiring or moving or instructive to you about how one does the public work of, of, of governing? 
So I'm not an uh, expert in left and right sides of brains, <laughs> gotcha. but uh, so much of public policy is, is in a sense buttoned down mm. and has to be presented in a certain way publicly. It has to have a, an authority about it and a substantiality about it. And then, of course, there's this whole other aspect, which I would put the arts and creativity. And not that there isn't creativity in legislating and, and public policy, there definitely is. Mm -hmm. But just free form and expression and allowing every possibility to infuse. And so there are similarities, as I'm talking about. There are clearly similarities, but there are also some stark differences. And so, uh, yes, the arts allows us to imagine other worlds and to enter into those other worlds of creativity and imagination and somehow that gets infused with uh, inner parts of us that are at times closed off because of that public presentation and, and the formality of so much public life so for me it's it's that other other side of myself other side of all of us that uh, we are better off when we allow it to infuse and when we allow mm. each of those worlds to infuse the other. So the, what, the creative world can enhance the creativity of the button-down world and uh, the authority of, of the one can also enhance Inform the, the other. other. Yeah. So I'm, this, thinking, I'm thinking of that lyric, a line that is cited in, in uh, Evita, that politics is the art of the possible, of course. Yes. It's, yeah, right. yeah. it's kind of what you're talking about in some mm -hmm. ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much. Let's talk about the ways in which um, San Francisco so strongly identified with the arts across the range, major institutions, the smaller groups, the cultural districts, down to the smaller groups. It's so much a part of San Francisco's identity. How broadly, before we get to specific policy issues, mm -hmm. can you, as mayor, support, enhance, nurture the arts, especially in times that are challenging in, in so many other areas? So I can refer back to some of my experience in public office. I arrived in Sacramento as a first year assemblyman in January 2003, following my election in November of the year previous. And it was just on the heels of the dot-com bust. Mm -hmm. And the state lost an unimaginable percentage of its general fund. Most of it just from a single line item, uh, capital gains taxes, because the stock market mm -hmm. literally crashed. Mm -hmm. And so we were out also, so much money. And unfortunately, I won't get into it too much, but our tax structure is such that uh, we are highly dependent upon a top one, two percent. And you've got to go where the money is, especially mm -hmm. in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. But that also means that we suffer when the stock market suffers. And so the legislature, and I was there then at the time, had to deal with a $20 billion budget deficit. And we have to, by law, balance our budget, unlike the federal government. And so we had to make horrible cuts. 50% uh, of the entire budget due to a formula is spent on K through 14. So public edu education took a big yeah, hit. Yeah, mm -hmm. But then we had to cut social services, and we had to cut health care, and we had to cut all sorts of things. And one of the first things my colleagues thought of doing, uh, this actually preceded me by a year, was the California Arts Council's right. budget. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Arts Council funds local schools and community-based nonprofits, which provide art and music education. Mm. And traditionally, the legislature thinks of such funding as icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be the first to go. Mm -hmm. And they don't really think or have a knowledge base that, no, that is not icing on the cake. Mm. That is fundamental to what we need to be doing uh, in terms of educating our next generation and our next generation of audiences. And so I don't know that a lot of policymakers recognize that if we're talking about sustaining major arts organizations, our ballet, our symphony, our opera, uh, not to mention all the community-based smaller budgeted grassroots organizations, they can only be sustained if we have an audience to sustain it. And we only have an audience if that audience has some familiarity and maybe hopefully some education from the earliest years that leads them to want to be an audience member, much less a sponsor or a patron. Mm. So 
everything begins to get wobbly and shaky when we do away with the Arts Council's funding. And we went from about a dollar per capita, meaning about $40 million, out of the general fund for the California Arts Council down to two. We cut 98% mm -hmm. of its budget. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we had to get creative. We did a license plate. You know, how can we cobble together a few extra pennies? And we ranked 50 out of 50 states in per uh, capita spending on the arts. New York State, $5 per capita. Minnesota, $4.50 per capita. California, entertainment capital of the world, mm. three cents mm. per capita. Mm. It's embarrassing right. and tragic. How is that story instructive going forward for you in, as, in San Francisco? How do you make the case that, that arts aren't the icing, but they're the yeast in the cake as were? How do you, That's how do you, the word I was <laughs> trying to how find. Do you, how, do you, how do you make that case? What's the case for it? broadly? Well, th one of the benefits of the mayor's office is, of course, the bully pulpit. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the mayor can lay it out for the voters, the taxpayers of San Francisco, and, and try and raise consciousness and, and also be present, be present in a public way to sustain, and not just the major arts organizations, the community-based organizations, to show that the mayor understands there's a need for all of us to come together and do our part mm -hmm. in sustaining these organizations, that we are the richer for it. We will be the poorer without. Richer in what sense? Not just in terms of, you know, a, a, a more ideologically and emotionally and artistically richer community, but ways in which the arts are an engine of other things that they interact like with. Like the, the economy. Other exactly. What's yes. The, what's the case? Well, when you figure that our uh, hospitality and tourists and convention business is a major driver of employment in the city. I think it's about 80,000. And entertainment, performance, museum, visual, literal, literary, musical, uh, dance arts are all a part of that. Mm. And when the Convention and Visitors Bureau, now San Francisco Travel, is promoting San Francisco as a destination spot, what do you think they're showing off? Mm -hmm. Exactly the mm -hmm. organizations we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it is real dollars and cents. Uh, so yeah, we suffer there, but then we also suffer uh, in the formation and the building of a next generation of audience. Mm -hmm. And then also just all of the magical aspects, the ineffable aspects mm -hmm. of the arts. Mm -hmm. At a time when people are saying, gee, you know, we have to address the homelessness issue, we have the housing issue, we have the economic, the you know, inequality issue, we have the quality of street life, traffic. How does the arts take its place in that and, and play into some of those other issues? So you could look at it from at least one of two ways. <clears throat> one way is it's in competition mm -hmm. for all of these other major significant needs, or that it will help sustain us and help us make better decisions and have a greater sensitivity to the humanity of the decisions that we're making. Mm -hmm. So let's not think of it as competition, but enhancing our decision making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there ways in which addressing some of those other issues in, in sort of practical, real terms, can the arts can play a role in, for example, homelessness or, or uh, you know, the housing issue? I mean, certainly one issue for artists is that it's very difficult to live here. Artists don't make a lot of money, and, and so that, that all of these dots are connected. Mm -hmm. All of these dots are connected. Don't, you're going to get me going now in my soapbox. That's but good. Get on it. If we're talking about uh, education, of course, how we're going to sustain our public education system and our public school system, uh, we need teachers who can afford to live in our community. We need art teachers to be able to afford to live in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the arts organizations to be able to stay in our community. Where do these community-based organizations rent space? Mm. So everything is interconnected mm -hmm. and uh, right now we have a real challenge not only, well, all of these arts organizations they, by definition are small businesses. Mm. I'm a small business owner here in San Francisco for 40 years so I have a direct connection and sensitivity to the challenges that small business owners face or those who run small businesses. And space, just where they can operate, is now a real question. And we see such an exodus to Oakland and other places in the East Bay. That's uh, heartbreaking to see. 
At the same time, and this is a bit of a conundrum that no one has yet to explain because we're really challenging the laws of supply and demand mm -hmm. that uh, for thoughtful purposes and reason, we require all new residential developments to have ground floor retail. Mm -hmm. And we're putting up a lot of new residential developments. I'm just thinking in particular from Octavia Street to Castor Street on Upper Market, every one of those triangular spots right. that used to be a right. gas station is right. now a housing development. Right. They all have ground floor retail because you don't want people living on the ground floor and then having no street traffic. You want to draw people to right. these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You want to create new, mm -hmm. vibrant, sustainable mm -hmm. neighborhoods. So we put in ground floor retail. That's a good thing. But uh, because of the way retail is changing right now, I know you would never do such a thing, but I understand that some people are making purchases online. What a strange thing to do. <laughs> never and, and No. And there is a, a downside to that because mm -hmm. what will become of our merchant districts if this trend, this phenomenon of purchasing everything out of, conver out of convenience online continues to grow? They could be at serious risk. They're already in great challenge right now. And so mom and pop retails and other small enterprises have a real hard time paying the rents. Now you'd think with a glut of retail space on the market, the price would fall. It's not. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. And so we've got a lot of vacancy. Uh, one idea, and I think it's been used in uh, Vancouver, for example, uh, and I've heard this from a lot of uh, leaders of merchant associations across town that properties that are owned by out of town landlords. Oftentimes they're insurance companies just investing their surplus dollars, their pension funds investing dollars. They will keep their spaces empty thinking down the road it'll only garner a higher price. So they can, it's a write-off. They sit on it, right. They sit on it and right. all of this empty space. Well, it's causing blight. So the city suffers, the neighborhoods suffer. And so you out-of-town landlord uh, should pay a tax on it. And we can use that tax for a variety of things, but what if we use that tax to subsidize community-based nonprofit organizations, arts organizations, even some retail, for-profit retail, to help fill these spaces that are available? We don't want them to leave town and go to Oakland or some other place. We've got the space here. It's just not affordable right now. And these uh, merchant leaders are also telling me that when the property is owned locally, it seems that the landlord is more willing to negotiate mm -hmm. to be able to work with an entrepreneur who can afford 2000 a month, but not 5000 a month. So there's a difference uh, in a situation depending upon who owns the building. But uh, I would be very open to, and it, it, it would have you know, d devils in the details, some thought would have to be put into how, in fact, we administer something like that. Right. How we would determine, did some uh, landlord have the opportunity to rent and decided not to? But if you keep your place open, uh, vacant for an extended period of time, I think you should gain some, yeah, I mean, something you, back to the city. And I would love to see it go toward arts organizations, among others, to be able to stay in town. All right. I mean, you use the word blight, I and mean, it's not really a direct comparison, but I mean, classically, in places like Detroit, what starts to bring cities back like that is when the artists come in first. That's right. That's right. And so, yeah, I mean, it's not a direct analogy, but in a way, it's, it's, it's resonant with what you're talking about here. I'm reminded of Richard Flores' right. book, The Creative Class. Right, exactly. That's what makes metropolitan areas attractive and vibrant. Right. Are there areas of the city where you see potential for more of that sort of thing going on? Um, uh, parts of town that, that you feel are sort of underused in that way that we might well, particularly... Well, certainly that stretch of upper market, but it's not the only place mm -hmm. where we're building. Uh, you know, there are towers going up everywhere. And that's one of my criticisms of uh, City Hall right now, is that it has not been negotiating as well as it should be on behalf of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes it's negotiating on behalf of multi-billion dollar corporations and we're not getting what we, the city, should be getting out of some of these deals. And so if there's a tax break like we saw for mid-market that uh, what are the community benefits mm -hmm. and what are the enforcements of those promised community benefits. And another thing I've been talking a lot about is enhancing local hiring. So you want a tax break. Uh, to incentivize industry to come into a certain part of town. 
well, that's all well and good, but what are we going to get out of it? Okay, there'll be new jobs created, but are all those new jobs going to be for people coming from out of town? Mm. What's, what are San Franciscans getting out of it? Mm. And what are San Francisco organizations and the heart and the soul and the foundation of our city going to get out of it? Mm. I don't think we've been negotiating on our behalf well enough. It's one well, of my speaking, criticisms. About, speaking of out of town, is one of the things that, as you, of course, well know, that has funded the arts historically here is the hotel tax fund, depending yes. on dollars coming in from out of town largely. Supervisors Peskin and Tang have a proposed ballot measure in the fall, which I'm sure you're familiar with, I imagine you are, about reestablishing the historic connection between hotel tax and funding for the arts. Are you in favor of that measure? I am, and would you think it's a fair description to say it is a an outcome of the nearly past Prop S last year. Well, yes, exactly. Can I, that yeah. Indeed, yeah. So I was a big supporter of Prop S, mm -hmm. and I know that there was consideration of uh, Prop S uh, 2.0, and I think the Tang Peskin proposal came out of all of that. Right. I believe that's true, and I think the arts people are comp solidly behind this. Yeah. This, and you would, yes. you would support it yourself. And yes, and uh -huh. historically, interestingly enough, uh, we have to go back to the crash of 08 where a desperate city needed money to balance its budget and took the hotel tax fund Once money. Once again, the icing argument. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it was, uh, we, we need this money too bad. Uh, and maybe there might have been a hint that we'll restore it later when we get over this hump. That never happens, of course. And so we, the community had to go uh, uh, down a war path to go get it. Yeah. You raised it earlier, but um, arts education is a huge issue. That's where yes. it starts. Without arts education, so many things wither and never develop in the first place. Yeah. It's disappeared from public schools, not just here, not completely disappeared, but certainly been diminished. First of all, what's the argument for why the arts are important in the school, and what can, what can you as the mayor and, and folks in government sure. do about enhancing and seeing that those things thrive. And so I can tell you from every report, every analysis, everything that I've ever read on the subject, students that study art and music test better not only in reading and math, but in science. They have higher rates of self-esteem, no surprise. They have lower rates of dropping out of school. And here again, connecting dots, a student who doesn't complete high school and get a degree has a seven times greater likelihood of finding his or her way into our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about education, encouraging and inspiring students to stay in school and to get a high school diploma, if not pursuing higher education or a career technical uh, education, uh, we're also providing safer communities and lowering, lowering the growth rate of our Department of Corrections, which is the fastest growing department in state government. So again, connecting these dots and recognizing that we know what works. Mm. We don't need another study. Mm. We don't need another mm. analysis. Mm. We know. Mm. And sometimes we don't even pay attention to the evidence-based information in front of us. So it makes sense on so many levels to make sure we invest in art and music education. And that's something I pursued for all of my years in the legislature. My very first year as an assemblyman in 2003, again, dealing with an ongoing budget crisis and recognizing that the Arts Council had been decimated, I thought the arts needs a new and dedicated revenue source to sustain it so that it will not be held hostage through the vagaries of our annual budget process. Mm -hmm. So I remembered that when I was on the Board of Supervisors, I think it was Supervisor Mabel Tang was able to successfully add a very small little surcharge onto the cost of a Giants and 49ers sports ticket. Mm. You wouldn't even know it was on, and mm. you don't know it's on, but it is. And that went to physical education for students in our public schools. I thought, well, why don't we do that for the arts? Mm. Let's put a 1% surcharge on every entertainment ticket sold in California. So, and the state's the legislation, a $10 movie ticket mm -hmm. would cost an extra buck. Right. A, di a dime, excuse right, me, right. a dime. Right. Mm -hmm. As you go b into the theater to spend $20 on Coca-Cola and popcorn, a dime, a $100 opera ticket would cost an extra buck. Mm -hmm. And we extrapolated that we could raise about $40 million for the California Arts Council each year.
Mm. Just, just the amount that had been cut. Uh, yes. Mm. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, that did not make it out of committee. Yeah. <laughs> and my colleagues, uh, we would need a two-thirds majority vote to create a new tax. This is not in, uh, increasing a tax, it was creating a new tax. Uh, that's always a difficult thing to do, but I'm still convinced that's a very wise thing to do. And I, I should check, and I will be, with the city attorney, if Mabel could do that for physical, physical education, education at the local level, I, I, I'm not clear why we needed a change in state law to do it for art and education, mm -hmm. but it would make sense. Yeah. It's on several points now, you've been really uh, arguing sort of the economic model about why the arts are, we, we understand the arts are important in a sort of psychological, emotional, you know, it, it enriches our life. Yes. But, but it's really important to argue along some of the lines that you are, that it makes sense economically, it keeps kids out of prison, it costs us less money, they perform better in school, yes. all of these kind of things, and same with, the, with you know, with the, with the funding more broadly. It's an Let engine me give, for I, I worked with uh, then Attorney General Kamala Harris when I was still in the state senate. She was focusing on truancy and chronic absenteeism. There are children in San Francisco and throughout California who are missing upwards of a third of their school year as early as first and second grade. And when a child's missing that much school, they're falling so far behind. They're never going to be reading at grade level in grade three when they get tested or fifth grade or eighth grade. They're never gonna catch up, never. And then of course, the likelihood that they drop out is so great and they'll not get that high school diploma and they will be seven times more likely to enter into our criminal justice system. To think that an eight-year-old kid's future is being engraved in stone mm -hmm. is just mm -hmm. heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And so we worked together on some legislation to deal with some of the real challenges and factors that keep some kids from less advantaged communities from just getting to school. And she shared with me a, a statistic that I've never forgotten that in 2012, in San Francisco, 92% of homicide victims, not perpetrators, victims under 25 were without a high school diploma. So without a high school diploma, you are either gonna be, you'll be engaged in violent crime one way or the other, either as the assailant or as the victim. That's 92%. 80% of those in our state prison are without a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Getting down to the granular level here, what can the mayor do, what can the mayor's office do about arts education in San Francisco? So he or she can call the city attorney and say, do we need a change in state law to <laughs> put a 1% surcharge yeah. on every entertainment ticket? Yeah. So, and you know, so I had to work with some of the, uh, the local arts organizations in my district as I was proposing that because you can be sure I got some calls from my friends at the ballet and the symphony and the opera saying, you want to do what? Mm -hmm. And of course it was the movie theater owners that really killed that. They right. said, this is right. going to destroy us. Right. But uh, I got more resistance from the larger arts organizations than I did from the community-based organizations. They said, yeah, it they makes sense. They thought it was sense. going to be an inhibitor on their, on their? They thought that it would discourage ticket sales, subscriptions, if there was a 1% surcharge, I, I, I doubt that. Uh, or that they would have to eat the increase and it would come out of their own budget. Uh, no one likes change and no one likes a tax being thrown at them in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I, I, so it took a lot of time and energy, but I got most everyone to at least a neutral spot. Mm -hmm. But it was the community-based organizations that understood the benefit. Mm -hmm. And I got no resistance there. So is this something you might pursue and really try to? Do oh, yes, like without a doubt. And I, and I should have the answer to that question after all this time, but I don't. Yeah. But yeah. I do remember that it was inspired by something we did locally on, on yeah. athletic entertainment. Yeah. In terms of playing a direct role, I mean, San Francisco Unified School District has its own domain and purview of over curriculum and things like that. But again, are there things that the city can do after school programs or other kinds of things that can enrich and enhance and, and surround what UNIFI does? Are there things that the specific kind of programs or projects, in addition to the tax revenue? Sure, yeah. without a doubt. Uh, I don't know that there is a lot of synergy between the school district and some of the arts organizations that are already engaged in the exposure of art and music to our students in the school system. 
uh, the symphony has its adventures in music program, mm -hmm. the AIM program, mm -hmm. where I think they visit every school, That's middle right. school mm -hmm. in the district, mm -hmm. and the musicians from the symphony bring their instruments, and the students get to put their hands on them, and if you know their horns, they get to blow something. If it's a string, they get to touch something. It's real. And and then they get to hear and the percussionists, mm -hmm. and it gets kids' attention. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we went to school, we all started with the uh, recorders, and recorders things, right? in yes. uh, kindergarten, and right. then there was the school band, and right. we were privileged kids in public schools, right. and that's just not that way today. Right. So that's and then there's uh, music in schools today which is another nonprofit organization which does similar kinds of work. So I don't, I, I would imagine there, if there is some interaction and synergy that it certainly could be enhanced. Mm -hmm. And I would be, you know, so much of these public offices is just plain facilitator. Yeah. Oh, you've got a need, right. you've got an idea. Yeah. Oh, let's bring everyone together what and about make this public, happen. private partnerships, other ways to leverage those things to make Certainly, things certainly. And We've got booming new industries in the city, and they need to recognize that there's benefit for them to engage. And uh, you know, I know some of this directly from, again, Michael Thomas and his ongoing efforts to engage newcomers to San Francisco and new industries to San Francisco and new donors to the symphony because the old guard dies off and the, and the inheritors of those fortunes may not have the sensitivity of the arts that their parents had. So he's, as a music director, always looking for funding for his organization. It's a big organization. And so uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity out there. There's so much wealth in this city right now. Well, yeah, and I don't think enough of it is currently directed at the arts and so many other of the needs in San Francisco. Well, it's what a frustration that people say all the time. There's so much money here. How can we not be addressing, you know, all of the right. many, the myriad yes. of issues, income. And let's also and recognize the heroes that we do have in our midst, like Mark Benioff, just extraordinary. Right. And he's trying to lead by example. And I don't know how many of his colleagues are following, but it doesn't stop him. Well, you talked about showing up earlier on. A lot of it is that, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mark Leonard, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you, Steve Winnis. Good to be with you. Great. Thank you. Thanks.